All right, what's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and I'm here with Buffy, a.k.a. Trent, or Trent, a.k.a. Buffy, uh, on Twitter. He's a, a listener of the podcast, and a while back, uh, I made an offer to the podcast listeners, whoever um, writes a rating and review on Apple and Spotify, uh, we can do a Q&A. So uh, I, we had this one scheduled for a while now, and I, I finally, Buffy reminded me of it because I've been so busy. And, um, yeah, we finally got to it, and he prepared some questions, and I'm always excited to do this. Not, not only because, like, the questions are cool and good to talk trading, but get to interact with the people that listen and stuff and, like, are interested in, in uh, what I'm doing. So, like, with trading, you know what I mean? So, like, it's always really cool. So, yeah, Buffy, how's, how's it going? Uh, not too bad. It's been a nice couple days. Today was a little bit more choppy, but uh, some nice relief we got this week from uh, past, you know, three weeks of – Bulls just running the ball up nonstop. So yeah, it has been really been vol- volatile lately. Yeah, except today. Today was calm. It was actually, I was doing like so. I was putting together some furniture, <laughs> like IKEA and stuff. It was like you know slower than usual. But uh, the past yeah, the past week uh y- yesterday yeah. wasn't for me. I traded a lot of stocks. It was like someone described it to me. Uh, I don't know if you know Lucas in the. I've interviewed, you know, we've talked, we've done trade reviews on the podcast before. Lucas Marin, shout out to Lucas. He's in, he's in Asia right now. He was saying it's like Pokemon. You got to catch them all. It's like yesterday was like Pokemon day. Like so yeah, many stocks. just going off. Yeah. Yeah, just... yeah. 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 So it's crazy. But yeah. So, so Buffy or Trent, you, which one do you want to go by? Yeah. Let's go by. Let's keep it Twitter, uh, Twitter centric. Buffy. We'll go okay. Buffy. Buffy. Now, okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Buffy. So, so you have some questions here. Okay, but before we get started, so we, we were, you were saying, I was like, before we started the podcast, hey, how you doing, this and that? And you're like, oh, I like the chat with Traders podcast. So yeah, I was like, oh, let's let's talk about that on the on the thing. So what did you think of it? Like, because that was my first time. It was a big deal. Like, yeah, you know, it is I, a big I, deal. Listen, I listened to chat with Traders for years and like, finally, I was, you know, I, I'm on it now. So like, what did you think of that one? Because that, that one, from, in my opinion, like, that wasn't like listening to it. We filmed it like like a month ago, and me re-listening to it, I was like, "Damn!" I like I spilled a lot of beans there. So, um, what what did you think of it? Yeah, I thought it was good, David. Uh, it's been one of my favorite shows, obviously, since you know Aaron started it many years ago, and always really good tidbits in that show. I, I thought your episode was was good as well, uh, talking about still the newsletter newsletter pumps and uh, you know the short interest off of ibkr and uh just general i think that show has kind of gotten away from the small cap side for the most part it seemed like in the last yeah. year or so so it was good to have a uh, small cap trader back on the show and um yeah just nice job and you know it's kind of a nice honor to be on that show because i think that's like the og trading podcast right so yeah yeah, thanks for that man um yeah so like i i went on a journey in that show we talked about the mean columbia the floor of growth the ib interest rate i have like wall street bets like it was a short selling journey but like all small caps a lot of small caps yeah, yeah. um good stuff so, so all right so these questions how do you want to go about them uh sure i mean i just prepared that list for you um we can just kind of just go through the list um, kind of take it off of that just conversation off of travel traders that you kind of just you, you were kind of going through a lot of different things talking about how you came up and, you know, you had to change your entire lifestyle around. You were, yeah, with, yeah, did, I, yeah. did I remember right? You were in Miami, right? You were living there for yeah, a little while. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm from Miami. Yeah. Originally from Miami and then went to college in uh, Florida and then came to Los Angeles for graduate school. And then like, yeah. Uh, when I decided to go to graduate school in, in California in LA, it's uh, I did even back then I was 25 years old. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to be, if I'm going to go all the way to LA, I'm, I'm going to be there like 10 years. I'm going to do architecture. I'm going to be in a firm. I planned, it was a long-term thing. And then like to switch all that, like years completely and do trading, it was, yeah, it's pretty wild. But yeah, originally yeah. from Miami and then LA. And so when, when I remember also when I moved to LA, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor. It was a different LA. <laughs> it was different California. You know what I mean? So I don't know yeah. where, where, where are you from? By the way. Yeah, so I'm in the Chicago area Chicago, right okay. now, and um, 
Yeah, I like it here. Actually, kind of just moved out to the suburbs. I've lived in downtown Chicago for a very long time. So just kind of made that journey out. And uh, so far, so good. There's a lot of traders living out here as well. We have the CBOE down here. And so there's a That's lot right. of OGs you, here. Have you been there? Have you been to the CBOE? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Downtown. Yeah, it's, it's pretty dead over there now. It's kind of uh, that whole area is kind of dead. It's kind of a shame because a lot of those traders and people working in that industry have kind of left and gone remote, you know, Citadel has left and um, yeah, that, that whole area of downtown is just not what it used to be. I think it's so, kind of. So, so hold on. Okay. So for those that don't know, okay. So CBOE is a Chicago board of options exchange. Is that what it stands for? Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so Citadel ha is, is located there, but I think this Ken Griffin just bought a lot of stuff in Miami. I think he relocated or a big mm -hmm. chunk of Citadel's in Miami. Is that correct? Do you, do you follow that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because that's kind of has to do with local politics. So uh, a lot of the local politics kind of wanted to, they wanted to tax LaSalle Street, which is our Wall Street here. LaSalle Street's where all the trading goes down yeah. and people are talking about taxing unrealized gains, et cetera. So a lot of these guys, I'm guessing, just kind of didn't want to wait around and see what happened with that and just decided to pick up shop and Nowadays, with electronic trading, you don't really need to be here anymore. So, yeah, you can trade from anywhere. So, so, so the LaSalle Street, I love this history stuff. And learning, like, okay, we have Wall Street in New York, everybody knows about that. So, LaSalle Street is in Chicago and it has the Chicago Boards of Options Exchange. And that used to be where the floor traders were trading options and futures and stuff. They had like a pit, right? Yeah, I think exactly. And I don't know if you know Chris Katie. Chris, K I think he just he, he had a chat with traders too. He was on. Uh, I had him on a couple of times. He, he's on the Sang Lucci team. I don't know if you know Sang Lucci and options and all that. Uh, shout mm -hmm. out to Sang Lucci and um, Chris Katie Mr. was. Herb. Yeah, there. You know, so like he, Chris Chris Katie was a a floor trader in the Chicago Board of Options, and he was a a, flo a member of the of the exchange. I don't know if you knew about that. He talk, and I, he just released the podcast. I think today uh, on Mark. The mark, what is it? Confessions of a market maker, and they're going over oh, yeah. that how they, and how they uh were trading in the pits and everything became automated in the late nineties. It's just so interesting. So like Chicago used to be like a, like a Wall Street kind of like there used to be like a little Wall Street there. Oh or, yeah, yeah. I think there's a ton of trading there with the CBOE. I mean, that's where kind of a lot of that stuff started. Ton of good books about that. You know, I'm sure you, I don't yeah. know if you've read them, but like Flash Boys and. Uh, any, yeah, yeah, yeah. any of those books i love reading books about trading so um just the, the history in the city is really great and uh, the financial sector is a huge part of the city and it's kind of sad to see that kind of part slowly making its way out but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, all things change so it is what yeah it all is. things do change and uh, yeah so we're gonna get started soon but yeah here in la for example down i'm in downtown la you're in downtown chicago i'm in downtown la crazy crazy parts so um they have a street that used to be the financial district of all the banks from the 1930s and 1920s, 1920s, 30s. And it's all these old banks and they turn them into like condominiums. No, not condos, like like really nice lofts. And and it's cool. It's still cool. It's still, it's still maintained well. But you see, they even had a L.A. stock exchange. And that yeah. 19, 1930, it, they closed it down because, of course, the 29 crash. But uh, the 1920s, it was like the roaring 20s. And people wanted to trade, trade, trade that they made the stock exchange to trade. And then a year later, it, it just, uh, it, it was like 1929, they opened and 1930, they closed. So like, yeah. you know, and like now there's no reminiscences of, uh, of like that era there, except like just a facade. So I guess maybe yeah. that's something like, like, like over there, like it's, you still see the facades and like the old buildings maybe, but like it doesn't function like it used to. Are you in LA right now or Puerto Rico? LA, LA, man. Yeah. So, oh, nice, oh, so nice. yeah. I, I, but I was in Puerto Rico for a while. Uh, I'm going to be back there eventually soon. Uh, you know, um, maybe next year, but, uh, yeah, L I'm in, I'm in downtown LA. So when you see this background over here, this is all downtown LA, uh, US bank tower, the skyscraper. Nice. I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the sky right now. You can't tell, but I'm in the, yeah, that's where I'm at. But, um, yeah. So, so, how do you, what do you what's your what do you want to do what do you want what's your question here how do you want to start 
Yeah, so let's just go get right into it. We'll kind of yeah, take you back off that history. And, you know, I'm just yeah. kind of interested in, you know, I'm still working a full time job. In addition to trading, I'm lucky and able to have flexible hours. So I have access to the markets all day and I'm able to watch tape and everything. But um, so I guess what helped you make that call to go full time, despite, you know, you had a nice career as an architect. I'm sure it pays well, it's secure no, it, and it, all it, that. No, it, it, I, so, you know, architecture is not that, man. And starting out. So everybody imagines that, but architecture is not that. Like when you start out, so you do 10 years of school, pretty much eight to 10 years of school. Then you got to do another two or three years of uh, getting hours uh, to take the exam, to get licensed. So you're still not getting paid very much. You're getting paid on average a low salary or 25 to $30 an hour. That was the 2017, 2016 when I, rates. I don't know how much it is now, probably a little more because inflation, but no, so like architecture, you don't really get to do what you want to do until you're like mid 40s or 50s. All the famous mm. architects that I like, they they're all I looked at their trajectory throughout their career, like they all pretty much started like late 40s and 50s. Like we see them in the books, we see all their buildings but like so I had to come to a realization of like I so first the first thing is you got to you got to think ahead, right? You know, it's like part of being an entrepreneur, you got to be like a visionary or as far as like okay, what's my 10-year plan? What's my 5 to 10-year plan? Uh am I going to be where I want to be, you know? So when I looked at that, that's one thing I did right early on. I was like, all right, so architecture, this is not good. I in travel traders, I think I mentioned it. I was like, I calculated the money, I'm never going to pay these and and I had student loans. So I was like, I yeah. calculate, I was like, this is not going to work. I'm going to be in my mid fifties. Uh, by the time this is paid off at this rate and like, I, I'm not going to live the life I want to live. So like, but, um, but I did it very drastic, man. Like, you, you know, I, I, I don't have kids. I don't, I was, I'm not married and I was in my early thirties. So, and I was in the same position. I had no kids, not married. So like, and I'm like detached from, from, uh, I'm in another state alone pretty much uh my family's in florida so like i didn't really have anything tying me down the, mm -hmm. the the biggest move i did was from miami to la and that was a drastic move so that was already done so it was a decision of like can i afford uh to to dedicate full time because yeah i didn't have any savings you know um and I, I, you know, it's very expensive to live in L.A., uh, you know, having a, a, an apartment or a place to live. And uh, I had a car at the time. Was at, I had bills in the car and just cell phone bill. All this adds up. And so at the time, I remember all my bills would be like, I don't know, I, I, I kind of remember maybe like 2000 to 3500 a month if you include all my bills. And I was like, all right, so that's the bare minimum. And if I want to, so I, I signed up for the Tim Sykes course. That was expensive. So I put all my bills secondary. So I was behind on all my bills because I paid for this course. And I was like, all right, now I got the material. It's like 10,000 hours worth of stuff. Now I got this. And at the time, I think it was like a lifetime supply of, of it wasn't like a one year thing. So I was like, all right, I got this. Now um, I can start paying my bills. And I took up all these odd jobs. You you name it, man. I did like, I remember, you know, for I did Uber, Task Rabbit, Grubhub, Rover. I babysitted dogs. This is like for a short period of time. I paid all these bills. This app called Handy, um, Postmates. What's the other one? Uh, all of them combined at the same time. Lyft. Uh, I don't all, all of them. I signed up for all of them, and then eventually after. Doing all that, I I in constantly thinking of a way to generate income. I was like, oh, tutoring. So tutoring actually took off. I tried tutoring right away, and I liked it. And and it was minimal work for a good wage. Like two two hours of tutoring was a few hundred bucks a day, and I was like, or no, like a hundred bucks a day. Let's say fifty fifty dollars to seventy five dollars an hour. And then um, I was able to okay. So eventually, I was able to like quickly makes a decent amount of money where I can leave every other, the architecture job, all these other odd jobs and just do two hours of tutoring a day and then um, study full time. I think that, that was it. So like I decided, and once I decided to leave architecture, see, I think people, they, they're, 
they get, I wouldn't say stuck, but like they get, they get scared of taking that risk uh, to leave the career. Because I knew if I stayed in architecture, I wasn't going to be able to study the stock market. And I wasn't going to be able to study all this material. So, like, I was like, and, and if I leave architecture, it's hard to come back to it. Because then you get, it gets out, you get outdated. You leave for a year or two, it's like all the software programs you learn, all the drawing, everything advances so fast. And I'm like, you know what? I I only have a certain amount of years in this planet. And uh, I had a big brain operation also. I don't know if you know about that. Uh, yeah. Like, years before. And that kind of w- woke me up to, like, how little of life you like we you know it's not oh, a brain it's very, operation very, yeah brain operation a brain tumor i had a, a brain oh, tumor um a 20 hour operation uh I, I walked into the hospital with headaches and they they did an mri and that and I, I don't know if i talked about this before on, on the podcast but they did an mri and uh they said oh if you if you don't if you leave the hospital you can die any day now and within two weeks you just die in your sleep and uh i was like damn so like and the insurance won't cover it if i left so i was like i had to stay in the hospital i couldn't leave um until they did the surgery they did the surgery uh it was a friday they they did the surgery on monday and my mom flew from miami to la immediately and like took care of me i was a basically a vegetable for like a year it was, I mean, it sucks to say it that way, but I was like a vegetable for a year. And I remember the doctor one time in my, in my state I was in, uh, with the tubes and all that. No one knew, like, I'm still paying attention though, but no it, outsiders don't know. So they're speaking like I'm not there, <laughs> you know? So, and the doctor said to someone, I just gave him 50 years to live on. And I was 25 at the time. And I was like, damn, even in my, my state, I was like, I was like, damn, 50 years. That's like, I'm 25 and, my, and I was on so many drugs like trazodone and Seroquel and I was like damn that's I was able to calculate it I was like that's I'm 25 that's one more 25 than another 25 that's two more times of what I just lived I was like damn so like that's always stuck with me and I uh, I guess that's a constant urgency thing so like that's changed my view on everything so like when you say or when you know when I calculate those student loans and all that, I say late fifties. I'm constantly thinking, damn, that's like that's time that's a, of my life. Uh, I'm not gonna, you know what I mean? I, I'm not. Just, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. So like, yeah, I decided just to leave it, man. But like, at the, when I left architecture and did that, my life, like, I was a minimalist to the max. I don't think anybody wants to live like that. That's the thing with trading. You got to do what everyone doesn't want to do, and um, I lived minimally. Uh, I was, there was no social interaction. I really went full Batman mode for like three years. No one saw me. There was no dating. There was no partying. There was no drinking. There was no nothing. I like, I sold everything I had just to like pay, you know, so I can afford my, you know, put money in my account. I had like $2,000 in my account, my trading account. Um, I was just paying the bills and I was working tutoring here and there. And like, you know, the tutoring was cool because, like, people kind of respected you. you. I would teach all subjects, and I would teach even, like, architecture classes for college kids and stuff. So, if you know, I was still getting respect. But, like, all those um other jobs, people treated you like trash, man. I was like, damn, you know, this I have a master's in architecture. And, like, when, you know, when I drove Uber a little bit or Postmates or something, people just treat you so bad. I was like, this is terrible. But uh, it was just a means to an end. I had the goal of, like, of just trading and studying, you know. I was always listening to audiobooks. Um, I was always, you know, uh, anything I could on online, you know. Uh, YouTube, I would watch even all, all, the, all the Tim Sykes stuff, especially. People say, oh, it's redundant, a lot of the stuff repetitive, a lot of fluff. I just kept listening to it. I knew if I just do what these other people did that were successful, there was a few of them. And then, you know, with, with my relentless attitude, I'll, I can do it. And like, you know, along the way, I've seen a lot of people start out with enthusiasm and like, you know, and they even have a little streak going and they're not here anymore, man. You know, it's just like, yeah. you know, it's, it's just the hardest thing. That, I mean, that anyone could do really. Yeah, you know, and so stick with it. Yeah, so and and like <laughs> I think and a, a few people that I thought, oh, this is gonna be, 
they, they're for sure going to, you know, and they were ahead of me at certain points um, that they're not here anymore. You know, I think they had in the back of their mind that they had something else as a fallback. So what I did, I have to, right across from me right here, you can't see it, but I have a, a painting of Hernan Cortez of burning the boats. And that was, mm. a, that was huge for me. So Mike Bellafure from SMB Capital, maybe you know who he is? Yeah, SMB yes. Capital. Yeah, yeah. So he wrote the book, The Playbook. And in like the first chapter or so, he references this YouTube video of Hernan Cortez of this guy. I forgot the, of this motivational speaker guy, some, some, some speaker. And I, and that, the playbook, I, everything that was referenced outside of the playbook, I would go and look it up. Mike Bellafure referenced that YouTube channel. I'll go and watch the YouTube. It was only a couple. If he references this this book, I got that book. He referenced like ten or fifteen books in there. I got them all, and I listened to them all, mostly on audio. But that's that was my mentality to suck up every single piece of information. So, anyways, I listened to this Hernan Cortez um, video, and it's like that's exactly what I did. I just burned the boats. You know the burning the boats uh, strategy. Do you know about that? No. No. So Hernan Cortez yeah. is this war strategy. Uh, that the Greeks and Romans use is it's a it's a well known war strategy of, of burning the boats and uh, you know for example you know it's like when you're backed up into a corner you have no choice but to fight so like you're gonna fight with more strength you're gonna push forward it's like survival and usually that's when it brings the best out of you you have your best chance it's crazy you have your best chance of of fighting back and winning when you have no choice no option you got to do it so so anyway that's the 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 concept. So Hernan Cortez was a conquistador. You know, the conquistadors, they conquered all uh, of the Western Hemisphere on behalf of the Queen of Spain back in the 14th century, no, 15th century. But anyway, Hernan Cortez was the, was the conquistador to conquer uh, Mexico, that area in Central America. He was the one. They're, they sent a bunch of different conquistadors all over, but he was the one that conquered Mexico. So he came with these with the conquistadors, these guys that were like, basically, they were peasants in Spain. They had, they were illiterate. They were peasants, very poor, and it, they, they had an option. They, you know, to join the conquest to conquer lands on behalf of the queen and get rich, get riches, become a governor, become a mayor in the new, the newfound land, the new land in the West. So they all signed up. These are just poor people, you know. Um, so and then they get they get armor they dress up and then they go on the ship, uh, on the voyage to conquer land. So they Hernan Cortez is, is the is the leader the con, the conquistador leader. Uh, I don't know if you've seen have you seen those soldiers like in the armor and stuff in the paintings. You know what I'm talking about the conquistador. Yeah. 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 So th picture that. I I love the imagination. You know what I mean. So, by the way, the conquistadors guided Christopher Columbus. Uh, to, to discover America, the Nina and the Pinta, they had like a bunch of conquistadors on it. So he was sent with with them on B, You know what I mean? So, so anyway, um, Hernan Cortez lands in Mexico with like 300 soldiers. I, I see in the painting there's like five boats, but who knows? Maybe that's not real. But he has some boats, and uh, they're coming. They have to like uh, they see these Aztecs. I think in Mayans. I, I think it was Aztecs, and the Aztecs like are you know they're all crazy and they're like. They eat people and then cannibalism and so. And then the, the conquistadors are like they're kind of scared. They're like they're like man, this is too much. And there's a lot of them. There are only 300 conquistadors, but the conquistadors had the weapons, had like the armor. They had the the advance. The 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 natives didn't have like that. They were more like you know just just like I don't know savages, um, pr yeah. pr primitive savages. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know so. Um, so then they didn't want to fight. They wanted to go back to Spain and like get on the boats and get the hell out of there. So, but then Cortez stayed quiet. He's like, all right, you know, these guys, because like once one person complains, it kind of spreads. So like it, it spread throughout all the soldiers. One guy, you mm -hmm. know, a few complainers and then everybody starts complaining. So anyways, yeah. they, when he went, when they went to bed, but Hernan Cortez, he, he wanted like to do or die. He didn't, he, he wanted to conquer this. Then he becomes a governor. He, he, he had the idea and he knew that they, they, if they do things right, they had a chance because he heard all those other stories of the conquistadors. But anyway, so when they went to bed or went to, went to sleep on, on the land, they were going to head back. Hernan Cortez was like, all right, you guys want to go back? Let's go back. We'll just go back. Let's uh, get some rest and we'll, we'll start going back tomorrow or something. So then he goes, when they're sleeping, he burns all the boats, he puts them all on fire. They're all burned. 
And then they, these guys, they wake up and they and they go to they're pissed, you know. I was like, oh man, what what the hell? Was <laughs> and then Hernan Cortez, yeah, is, yeah. So Hernan Cortez, say, like, all right, man, what are you guys gonna do? You guys, you can kill me. What's that gonna solve? You're still gonna be here, and these savages are gonna come and kill you and eat you. <laughs> or you can, yeah. you can, you can, <laughs> or you can fight. You choose to fight, and we go and conquer and become rich, become. So they're they're like, you know what? He's right. Like we we just kill him right now. Uh, what are we gonna conquer? We we're stuck. We all the boats are gone. So they chose to fight, and and they won. They they won. They stuck it out. They they won. All three hundred of them took over all of Mexico. Hernan Cortez. You know, that's another political thing, whatever. But like the the main gist of it is is the burning the boats uh, analogy, you know? So I, I decided to do that. I'm like, you know what? Architecture is done. I'm going to keep, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep coming back. Even if, so I listened to like some old market wizards thing. I forgot which, who's the guy in there. Uh, I think Michael Martin, he went, no, not Michael Martin, but like one, one of them went and like washed dishes and came back with a steak. I was like, man, if I got to go wash dishes, and if I blow up my two thousand dollars and go wash dishes and you know and live in a in a in a in a shithole or whatever, I'm just gonna keep coming back. I'm gonna keep coming. I don't care. I'm I'm this is it. I'm I'm gonna do it until it works out. So that was my mentality, and that was, you know what I mean. Um, I was okay with with no social life, whatever. It just sucked. You know, you meet someone on the street or whatever, or in 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 life, and they're like, "What do you do for a living?" And I'm like, "Setting the stocks." You know, and like I, I wouldn't even say I was like, yeah, I'm an architect, whatever. I was kind of. It took me a long time to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a trader, and like I, I worked on that with the, with the coach, but like to, to like this is my identity now, you know. But um, but you know, you got to earn that, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. I, I just decided to throw it, you know, not, not throw it all out, but like I was like, I'm just moving one way, and I'm gonna keep coming back. I'm gonna live minimal lifestyle, and I'm gonna prepare. So like, I did uh. You know, I was paying off like my credit card bills with a little tiny bit of money I got because I knew if I pay my credit, everything in my life was organized for me to succeed at trading. So like I was like, all right, this credit card debt is bothering me. I need to start chipping away at this because it's going to help my trading. Um, All right. So I need to get my health in order. I need to, you know, all these little things. And then like buying certain books only, you know, everything was was all about the the bigger picture of becoming a successful trader and like me having uh in the back of my mind, Oh, I could do architecture. That was not helping trading. So I was like, I just got rid of it. I was like, architecture is done. I'm doing trading right now. And I think going back to the people that I saw not succeed in trading after I thought they would, and like really smart people and people that were successful for a, a minute at trading. And then like all of a sudden they, they're doing something else. I think they always had in the back of their head they can do something else. So like if that's it's 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 a distraction, man. You know, so for you know, and there, there's a lot of examples. So like I think if I would have been like, oh, you know, let's say I tell everybody I'm doing trading, trading, and this is, this is the way I have this work ethic, but I'm I have this secret that in the back of my head that I'm not telling everybody, but I know in the back of my head there's like that one percent. You know what? I can go back to architecture. I think that's enough to distract you, man. That's an, even if it's a, if it's something nobody knows. If you, it's like every, you know what I'm saying. It's just like, I, for me, I was, I got rid of that. It was all 100% focus uh, for trading. So like, I don't know. So I saw it as I, I'm not. This is this is it. I'm gonna keep coming back, and I'm gonna give my. You know, nothing is guaranteed. You're taking a risk by doing trading, but like. I said, it's just, it's just this or, or nothing else, man. So, like, the same way Hernan Cortez, they, they they had to take that risk, you know. So, entrepreneurs take risk. So, like, I don't know. I, I mean, I if you do have a, a, a nice job that you can – like, I didn't have even any PDT money, 25K. That, was, that, that seemed impossible for me to get, by the way. But, like, that's an advantage. So, there's – whatever situation you're in, you know, it's like – What's most advantageous for you uh, to be to increase your odds for trading? And then at what point do you just focus only on trading? You really have to come to terms with that with yourself because, like, this shit is hard, man. This shit is hard. It's it's so oh, yeah, hard, know. you know. So so it it's like you really need all that mental focus 
you know, and like to have if if you have uh something distracting you or even the one percent, you gotta find a way to negotiate with that so it's not that that one percent thing doesn't affect you anymore. You know, it's 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 uh it's you know it's it's a it's a yeah it's a fine line, man. So like. Yeah, I don't. I like. There's no right answer from that I can give or anyone else can give. This is something you gotta figure out. You know what I mean? It's like okay, um, like what do I want from trading? You know what I mean? So like, cause cause yeah. you know this this life. You know, like you have a family and stuff. So like, you really have to um figure out what you know how how it's gonna work. But like, you know, so you want to give yeah, it your best of- shot. Figure that out. I mean, it's kind of working out well. Like I'm I'm about to like go to work about. In about an hour, either that, but I'm like a, I'm able to sit and because I mean we, I trade intraday setups only. I don't swing any. I'll, I'll swing some longs, but you know everything's intraday. A lot of it scanner based, and um, you know luckily I have a supportive family, and you know we're seeing this through the end. A lot of like the same thing here. I'd say you know, nine out of ten people that I knew. Three years ago, I'm no longer doing yeah, this. Yeah, you said. You so you've been in three years. Uh, yeah, the market's changed yeah. a lot. You know. So. Oh yeah. So are, are you? Are you? Uh, and hold it. So you. So you. Okay. So but your focus. Yeah, you. You said you, you're short now. I think you said right. Yeah. And so, are you like systematic or or uh di- discretionary? Or how how are you? Uh, did you figure that part out yet or? Yeah. So I guess you can call it a little bit of both. Um. So I was fortunate enough to kind of come into contact with a group of people close to about 18 months ago through a buddy of mine, Ken, that uh, I was doing some trading with. We met through discords, et cetera. We kind of, uh, I, I kind of started, got into the shorting when I found TTM or Trade the Matrix. And those oh, were yeah. kind of the setups I was looking at. I found, I think his material is really incredible and he puts it out there for free still. I mean, some of the calls are iffy, but you got to do that anyway. But great material. Uh, that's what got me started really short selling. But um, so I guess a mix of systematic and data. So like, I will know that like a certain stocks tend to push X amount off the open and fade X amount per day, but I'm not, uh, using that like to the T I still have discretionary uh, views on price action. Like if something's holding up like today on uh buying this morning and that pushed out of it off the open, I saw it kind of sitting there consolidating at VWAP. I was kind of adding on that range, but you know, I saw that soaking, and in this market, I yeah, just I, got out of there, got out of that play. But before it broke out again to the highs of like four at uh, close to five bucks, I think it was kind of kind of consolidating yeah, there. I, I traded Vine too. Yeah, yeah, I remember Vine. So yeah, so I saw Trade the Matrix was was uh, tweeting out some stuff on it too. Uh, yeah, he has a good read on them. Except this one didn't break down. Uh, like, no. uh, like I thought it would. It kind of held up. It's kind of holding up. F- tomorrow might even squeeze. Depends how much of that yeah. uh eight ATM or equity line that they unloaded to dilute the stock. But um, yeah, if, if they didn't. If, you know, if they didn't dilute as that much. It could it could squeeze, and it was easy to borrow. Yeah, that thing was was, was uh, a lot going on there. But um, yeah. But yeah, so so, but I, I like I like trade the matrix. You know what I mean? He has a lot of good good stuff to say. So this is the main thing that you. That the first few years, like, so you've been around three years. So like, yeah, you stuck. That's important. It's like something about that two and a half or three year mark that like is so important because you need all that, all that screen time, all that experience in the market to see things over and over, you know. And, and then like, so like you you you've lasted this long. So like now, yeah, that's that's the main thing, you know. So like you've already did yeah. a lot, you know. So it's just like now you're just figuring it out. So, um. Yeah, what what else do you want to go? You want to go yeah, over so Vine guess, or or, or you kind of yeah, piggy, piggybacking on that, David? So I guess like after, so we, you know, it's great story background. I love it. Uh, dedicate your life to it. It's great to see how su- successful you become on Twitter. To, uh, it's inspiring uh, to see that type of stuff, especially going from two K uh, all the way up. And now you're talking, you know, two K is probably like just normal. You know, normal day when you when you're just like done in an hour. But either way, so I guess what point were you at when that P and L curve kind of started going from flatlining up to parabolic? And I guess what 
what do you think was the catalyst for that? I know people say time one day, it just did it just one day kind of start clicking or out of nowhere. Or, I mean, were you able to pinpoint okay. in your career when that ha- might have happened? That's a good question. So, all right. So I loaded my account with over PDT from, from, you know, I was trading under PDT for so long and then May, 2020, that's when I put the money in there and, and, um, yeah, immediately I, I had a 20 K month the first month, but see that market was a different market, you know, and it wasn't just immediately I made it. It's like I studied for three years before that, <laughs> you know, so, and I was so scared to trade. I think that Tim Sykes, you know, he says the same little stuff over and over again. He's like, um, trade scared. So you, you're not scared to trade. And like in the beginning, I was very scared. I know it's, it's like, it's not the way I trade now, but as a beginner, I think that was really helpful. I was just so scared to get under PDT when I was like, put the money there. And the, the market was just ripe with opportunity then. In 2020, all these COVID stocks went crazy. So then, then so I had a buffer, but I see that market is, is not the same now. So like I had, so I was able to grow 25 to like 70K in just a few couple months off of just one strategy so i was still very insecure about trading because like i only i'm a one trick pony in a in a market that's not normal so i would say that the 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 biggest growth happened um when i went to puerto rico and and i absorbed knowledge and got to ask questions in person so like that's one way to do it and so you know what's crazy nobody does that man shout out to lucci and and trade space man like you know like no (laughs) Everybody knows it's a no-brainer to go there, spend a year there. I mean, it's no-brainer, yeah. Just go and spend, but like, like I don't can, think, right? I don't think, yeah, exactly. So like, um, I don't think anybody else has done it, man. Maybe like two or three people. I don't know, in like out of the whole world. So it's a single not, guy. That situation, I would absolutely. Do that. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. 100%. So yeah, it's, but like no one, no one's doing it, you know. So. When I was able to go there and ask questions, and I was still trading small, so my my whole when I went over there was I had the mindset of this is going to be like college for me. I have a bank role now because of uh, my initial success with 2020, and yeah, it was all 2020 and the beginning of 2021. I found like this one pre market strategy that was going that was working, and then it just disappeared. You know, mm-hmm. and this is a discretion. They, all these COVID stocks go crazy and then they collapse in the pre market. And there's like margin calls at the, t- at the time in the pre market, but people were over leveraged and it was just all this crazy pre market shoot ups. And then I, w- I would uh, fade them. But then the, in the regular hours, I would not trade because the, f- the very few times I traded, I gave money back. And uh, so I didn't, so I just didn't trade. So then when I came back from Puerto Rico here um, after a year in Puerto Rico, that's when things took off. I think my confidence in my trading um, from from uh, just one year of of uh, in Puerto Rico, I made some money. I you know I made 150 grand or something like that for that year, maybe 170 grand. But I I, I would wire money out every month because I was scared to lose it. So I would start fresh with 30 grand, or 40 grand a month, depending on how comfortable I felt. And any other profits, I would take out. So I was not so I was not trading size. So then when I came back over here and I'm and then I'm like 50 episodes in the podcast or something like that, um, I got confident with, with sizing up a, li- a little bit bigger. Not not like I do now. I like recently. But that click of sizing up, I think it's just compounding knowledge, compounding good habits. You do it enough. You have all this good self-reflection of yourself. Like you feel good about yourself where you're going. You're happy. I don't feel like a loser anymore. I don't feel like I'm grinding, like I'm, you know, like I'm socially awkward. Like people, because when I did the podcast, I noticed people were, you know, I was interacting with people and in trade space, I was inter and like people, I'm getting good feedback about my work ethic because before I'm just like in a, in a, in a vacuum. And uh, yeah. so like I started to get more confidence and then like slowly you, you, you look at your stats and you see the, that you're, it's going the right direction. Cause a lot of times with the way I traded, a lot of people, when you're starting out and, and you're even when you're green, 100 grand, you're still getting a lot of flack from people. 
oh, that's I wouldn't trade that, or oh my god, you did this, oh my god, you did that, oh my god, I would not do that. You should long, you should do this, you should do that. About at the at the trade space, people were saying this to you. No, or? no, 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 uh, no, nah, definitely not in person. This is all like uh, online, <laughs> oh, yeah. online, sure. yeah. You know, it's like for, for example, Tim Bowen. I, uh, I I I used to log on to his Instagram lives before every morning. I was like, oh wow, look at this, look at this pre-market fade. I just made two thousand dollars. And one day he went off on me. He yelled in the Instagram, like, man, I've never met a pre-market trader in my life. In my life, I would not do that. You know, you're this is like you, you need to, you know, you need to have discipline. And I'm like, this guy like doesn't know what he's talking. Like he doesn't know me. He doesn't know me or like yeah. what I'm doing. So like, and then I I remember I went on a Mark Crook. I love Mark Crook. I just listen to I still listen to his webinars. But he doesn't do what I do. I learned a lot from him, by the way, a, a lot. Like, he's a great trader, great explainer. He's disciplined. He's great. But, like, when I would interact in the webinars, this is the Tim Sykes webinars, with, I don't know if you know who Mark Crook is. I, I was just about to just Google this guy. I yeah. may. Oh, and, I may and, not. and this is like someone that I, I look up to as a role model. And then, like, uh, in the, but as a beginner, it's confusing. And I'll go to Mark Crook. Hey, I shorted this, shorted that. And Mark Crook berated me, berated me on, on the screen. It's recorded. If you dig enough, you're going to see him berate me. And I'm like, damn, you know, so you do, even though I I made money from it, let's say I was up like 30, 40 K at the time. And I, I was doing this pre-market thing at, at the time. And, um, and I did so much work and I'm making money from it. And then my my mentor berates me, and I'm like, damn, you know, I'm like, I, I, I'm now I'm just confident because it's survival mode. I know this making this kind of money is more than what I'm making. Uh, I'm not making anything any other way. So it's like I'm making, I'm just doing that strategy to survive, and I know it works. So it's like, who cares what this mentor has got to say? And in this, so then um, you know, it's like, I understood is is uh. It's it's just like when you that's what I'm saying like that that things clicked when when um I had confidence in myself and no matter who told me what I was like I did the work on uh, this strategy yeah. I did I did the stats the tracking um I understand what I'm doing to make the, maybe I don't understand everything but I understand this setup more than like I know this setup that I created that I know so like having that confidence and then developing other setups. And then, it, you know, over time and this understanding, like looking at like everything, like I've studied all everybody, trade the matrix here and there. I've studied everybody. Um, and uh, and then under, so I can I can uh, have conviction in what I'm doing. So if, if even like someone asked me today in, in the discord, David, you said VYNE was a high conviction trade for you, but it, it didn't like fully break down. I was like high conviction for me because I understand what's going on. I understand it's easy to borrow shorts. Too many shorts are in it. I understand like HC Wing right put a a price upgrade, so they have some algos in there for some kind of agenda. Uh, I understand they they are medium on cash. They have a little bit less than two years of cash available. I understand that they have an equity line. They have an ATM, and they have all time high volume. So even though they're not low on cash completely, this is a bear market. And uh, their all-time volume, they're going to need to tap into some of that equity line and ATM because they would be irresponsible of them not to. All-time record volume today. And at the same, mm. and at the same time, you know, um, I'm looking at the candles. I see what Trade the Matrix is seeing, that kill candle right there. Someone dumped. I saw a couple of uh, high-wick candles. I see, you know. So, like, that's what I mean by high conviction. For me, I want, in that scenario – was I understand what's going on and I understand the size down less. I understand, okay, after 11 a.m., this is not breaking down. This is, uh, I'm done with this. I'll take whatever. I, I, I was fortunate enough to gain, take, to have gains from it. So I'm taking the remainder of the gains and leaving it alone. And because yeah. there's a potential to squeeze, mm -hmm. uh, you got to respect it because it's still a 3 million float on dilution tracker. And dilution tracker is what I go with for the float, the most accurate float. So, all that comes from like that's and then all that information gives me confidence in my trade and then so when I started to get more so that's what I'm saying knowledge, experience, screen time, all this networking. I've asked like I've wrote a podcast like 300 people, I don't know 250 people on it, 
you know and so like that's what gives me the confidence and it's it's when i want to when i start to, to size up um also in trade space right next to me one of my good friends uh adam geffert you know massive trader he's a trade spray on kimfo one of the, so i saw him trading with size every day man this guy would trade my me and my whole family's net worth in one trade <laughs> like every day for like i don't know 200 days you know so even though i had a small account i would see him so much size and taking losses and taking wins and like you know he trades more like he takes he takes some i don't know he, he, you know it's like so now when i'm starting to size up i see myself like i i like i, I lived like what do you say vi vi vicariously <laughs> at the time yeah. i forgot the word so like now it's it's not only all the knowledge but like this the experience the live experience i had that's almost like priceless man now i think of it or even seeing luchi man i saw luchi take some big ass swings but he's doing options so i don't understand completely how options work but um but yeah you know so it's just like all this compounded experience and knowledge that gave me confidence so it's like I think that's when the curve really started to turn. Like last year is when I started to really size up, you know, from mm -hmm. instead of like 2,000 shares for the longest, I have sized up for 5,000 max shares and then left, you know, then would wire out money uh, after certain periods, but like longer periods. And then now it's getting to the point where now like I'm comfortable with 10,000 shares, you know? So, um, yeah, it's just, you know, and like honestly, what it's it's been since 2020. I so I remember I said I funded my account with over PDT May 2020. So it, it it's crossing on three years now. Where I, the three years I studied before that, I don't know if I would count that really. You know, because like as far as real trading, because I was all over the place. But like real focused trading since 2020, every day. You know, like it, it's not part time. Like every day is is like this. That's what I consider. So, like, that is just compounded. Every day, every single day, every single day for, for three years, almost exactly to the day, um, it, that's all compounded. So, that that is what I think after – it makes sense. So, after, like, two years of that, you're going to grow exponentially if you're doing the right things. And, like, I don't know. It's like everything inside of, and outside of the trading is is, a, is for trading. Like, when I go home today – I'm I'm eating a keto diet. Uh, I saw a brain, the brain scan guy, Doc Amen, gave me some vitamins. I drink water. I listen to like, you know, certain podcasts that are audio books. Everything I'm doing is like com for compounded, you know. So, yeah, you know. So the the learning curve is just like two years of that. You, you just I, if you're doing the right thing, naturally it's gonna you're gonna size up a little more, a little more, a little more. And that's the beauty about trading is that. And I said it like on chat with traders. If you do things right in a short amount of time, you can have massive success. And that's what the yeah. market is. You know, that's what the market is. In fact, it's it's hard to see that, man. It's hard to see. Like I was grinding it out two years ago, and now, like, you know, it's a it's a it's a big difference. So, <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't know for sure. So, like, commenting on that, David. So, like, just a question on that. So, yeah, yeah. Are, are you the type of trader that are? Do you believe in expert? exponential bet sizing or are you saying bet size every trade that you take or is that setup no. dependent or how does that work for you yeah so setup dependent like vine today it was high conviction the first hour or two so i had more size when it started to go sideways in the view i'm like man this is not uh, it's not breaking down a lot of shorts are in it i'm like 20 percent size and i'm like why am i even if i'm 20 percent size this, why am i even in this anymore so i just took it off did you so hit buying at the did you hit buying near five or were you in before that um it was it was it was it, I, I got squeezed and i just uh i wrote out the last piece so i was in around 460 something like that for you know like 470 ish i, I traded all around it was multiple times but it did squeeze me until it, it came down you know until like that last that last yeah. quick one one minute candle FBO, um, yeah yeah so one. so um no it's not i don't do like three three strikes or three full sizes no it's a, every everything is different so if i see a lot of dilution certain floats certain news all these different factors outside if i have really high confidence like yesterday 
there was one uh man i traded so much yesterday but there was one ufab there was a moon moon market guy pumping it oh man and i, I got stopped I out at the top of that i top tick stopped out of that thing uh so and so watch it fade 50 percent. so yeah. so what was your entry level for that like what did how did you look to enter that yeah so typically like subbies i don't i, I like them up at least first of all at least 100 percent for a yeah, yeah but um okay that's the same here yeah so basically once i saw i think i was i don't have my journal for me but when i was looking at it i saw like just monster volume candle come in and uh, kind of reject. So I'm like, I'll start it in a little bit. And um, so I kind of put some on. I think it was like 80 something, 85 cents or something like that. But um, it just was so strong. I just kind of wasn't used to seeing that kind of strength coming out of such a huge volume candle for that, uh, that type of ticker, I guess. So I kind of took it off. I'm trying to piece myself in. And uh, I didn't want to get like squeezed, even though it was up like 200 plus percent by that point. Yeah. But, um, once it broke a dollar and started really running, it's kind of when it should have been adding, but it instead um, it kind of hit my risk parameters because I'm not the type of trader that likes to let something go too far against me. Um, I kind of take it off and put it back on if I could. And I was, unfortunately, once it broke literally like 107, I think was my risk where I got out of that trade. But, um, and then you just kind of watch it fall after that fact but um you know seeing some of your charts and stuff i'm just kind of interested like how you would kind of attack something like that and without giving away too much but like no said, i'll, I'll give it away like, yeah no one, no one listens anyway you know so they got 300 <laughs> 300 yeah. something podcasts and like people are asking me questions that like obviously if you listen to some podcasts you wouldn't ask that question but you know anyway yeah um so you know, because I'm not, I'm not that entertaining. That's the thing. You know, you got to be like enter- making these facial expressions on the cover and like do this weird thing. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, you gotta start putting those, uh, putting those YouTube <laughs> thumbnails up. With the, you know, I'm not gonna do it. In so. the background or something. <laughs> you know, yeah, but, um, money, Corvette. There you go. But, but um, what do you call it? So I, the thing is, so I got, I got, I wouldn't say lucky, but. I don't have my scanner because this is a, this is intentional. So I don't have my scanner set for anything under a dollar. Mm-hmm. So when it, when I see it, it's usually when someone points it out and it's like two hundred percent up, or my or my scanner catches it at a dollar. And if it was a subby, I'm like, damn, that's a lot. It went from twenty cents to this. Wow. <laughs> so do- awesome. now it. So like that's when I saw it. So like my scanner brought it up, and I have this same earpiece. Um, notifying me and I was like oh it's at a dollar now and it's up 200 percent and then I looked at I have a pump list where I track all the pumpers like an active on discord yeah. and um and like moon market oh sick he's pumping so you know um and it had no news so no news pumper I forgot what the fee rate was so it's like I am a pure discretionary trader you know what I'm saying I'm I'm cons- I like to consider the human brain like uh better than any system i know you know where is this um one second so it's a 23 percent fee rate so i'm like all right there's a 23 percent fee rate that's doable uh that's like nothing it's like if i need to swing it i'll swing it this thing is garbage like moon market's right. pumping it there's no news it's up 200 percent. like and it's up from 20 cents this whole t- 10 cents to two one dollar or two dollars whatever yeah. this is a recent phenomenon of like the past, I don't know, we've seen a few of them. GCTK, GCTK was an Israeli stock, though, trying to meet the minimum $1 thing. That's a different story. And Israelis, they go hard with the algos and stuff. But um, this is not that. UFAB is no reason to be up. It has moon market. It has a 23% fee rate, which indicates it, there's not, it's not going to, you know, it's like not going to, it's not going to go like GCTK. Put it that way. GCTK went to six hundred percent fee rate from like twenty. You're talking about the fee rate. You're talking about the IBKR uh, short over yeah. rate, right? Yeah. yeah, and I and actually the most I've ever went over that was uh, in in uh, the chat with traders podcast. But I think that's like so much like a foreign language to most people. Like they're like, oh, what? you know, it's like, what is David talking about? Like, I'm not going to swing this thing. I'm a day trader. But like, bro, it's like this is an indicator of like if if it's going to squeeze or not. Like GCTK. That went from 
remember, like 20% to 600%. And the crazy part is, no matter what you're good with, I do remember that, yeah. If you're tracking data, you can't, there's no historical data on fee rates. I think uh, I borrow desk.com has like, it goes back like two or three weeks, but you don't have a historical data to like get some real, real tracking and real stats on it. This is a, at the moment, the only way to do that is the old noggin. That's the only way you can do it. Um, so like when I see GCTK go from 20 to 600 percent, it's like, oh my God. And I guess what happened is squeeze more. But this one was 23 percent. Is moon market pumping. There's no news. There's nothing. It's not Israeli. It's not Chinese. If it was Chinese, I have a different approach. If it was Israeli, I have, I have a different approach. Israelis are good with like um, really manipulating these things hard, like with algos and it's like a, they they're they're very good with that stuff. The Chinese they're good with like the doing some real sketchy things, and oh, yeah. you know they I like I got squeezed on PETZ 2021 at Trade Space. Uh, it mm-hmm. went from sixty cents to nine bucks. You know, uh, you know what oh, I mean. Man. I got squeezed. Yeah, it's a, that's how do you Chinese prepare for a move like that? So, like, yeah. So let's put, let's kind of circle back on that a little bit. So, if we're talking about UFAB, so UFAB is none of those things, uh, and but it was up two hundred percent. So, I guess my question for you is: you say I'm willing to swing it. So, I've spoken to. You know, I've had but, chats but, with. Uh, but my my en- my entry was over a dollar though. Right. So you were already, you had a great, fantastic entry, but regardless yeah. of the entry, you got to have an, did you even have an exit in mind when you entered that trade or your exit was, I don't, I'm going to ride this well, thing until it falls. It, it was, it was, it was midday. Let me, let me pull it up right here. This is actually a really good one. It was midday though. So midday is great because it has time. Time is on yeah. your side. Oh, actually, it's more than before midday. So time is on your side for the fade. So he has all this time so it, to, to come down for the volume to, to fade everything. So, it, you know, I'm looking at the minute charts. So it was it was strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for eight minutes. After eight minutes. Mm-hmm. Wait, is this? It says 70 cents. Are you, are you sure it went over a dollar? Oh, it went to 70 cents. You, you fell? Yeah, you fell yesterday from 15 cents to 70. And uh yeah, so actually no, I didn't get over a dollar. I think someone mentioned in the Discord said, Hey shit, look, check this out. Moon market guys pumping. And that's how I checked it out. Oh, wait, I, I'm, I'm thinking about BCLM. Never mind. My bad. That's a totally different ticker. BCLM. BC- oh, I shorted that one too. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, one yeah. I that, that one I got over a dollar because yeah. what's the ticker name? V? The v? I think it's B B is in Bravo, Charlie, Ligma, uh or M. BL. BLCM. BLCM, BLCM. It was like twenty cents, like a dollar or something like that that day. Yeah. Either way, okay. But UFAB yesterday, the moon market guy, and then and then it, it halted. It had a news halt, and yeah. it, opened, it it got down lower, and then it, it then uh and I got out, and then it came all the way back up. So when it re when it goes back up like that, and I'm not looking to short this thing because it's under a dollar, but when it goes that far up. And it's still like 150 percent or more in the day, and my same thesis is intact. So it, now I just got a, a nice re-entry price. So I think yesterday I entered that on, on the, like around the 50s when it came down a little bit. Then I entered; it was still up a lot. Then it came down all the way to like the 30 cents. And yeah. then, then it comes all the way back up to 50 cents where I shorted my entry. So like my thesis is still the same thesis: moon market, low fee rate. Uh, you know, uh, no news. The float. I think the float was high on it, high enough. Where I, I forgot what it was. The float is a big deal for me. So like, it was. Well, trade idea says seven. So well, like, I guess it, like, like, what point would you like bag? Would you nine. consider taking an L on something though? Because I've seen similar charts. Some of the guys in IU, it seems like they'll kind of just add them. They'll even kind of get out on the flush in order to take less of a loss or whatever. But it's like, that's not the way that I've been trading it all more or less. Like, once I take my entry, it, you, well, you, mean, you got is, you gotta figure, how it is. You, I mean, the, the first couple of years, you got to, you know, you got to do that to stay alive and to keep to fight another day and, and uh, you know, and figure yourself out as a trader. Then you're like, okay, yeah. um, Am I a systematic guy? Am I a discretionary guy? So, like, I'm not a systematic guy at all. Like, I just, 
I like to get a bunch of information and and play this like a sport. You know, like throw like Tom Brady's like figuring stuff out. He's not systematic. Like he's 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 there's some audibles that he does and and things like that. There's some you know that's what makes him who he is. But like if you're a systematic guy, you know, um, then you 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 know you do what you do. So me, I'm not Moon Market. It might is is a uh, I'm not gonna go full size all the time. I always keep enough bullets in me. You know, uh, at the same time too, I. I, I have a thick skin for pain. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. So like, I'm not saying that makes me riskier, but like I will swing this if I have to. What? Th- this thing is going to swing for no news and you more markets going to pump this for three days in a row. I don't think so, man. I'm going to, mm-hmm. you know, and it already had a news halt. It's like, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's like it cracked already. So when it bounced all the way back up and I reshorted it, I mean, I'll let this one play out. I, I, I'm not afraid to let things play out. You know, so big picture then. So you got like this bigger, much bigger picture in mind, like rather than just like a monetary target, it sounds like. Yeah, and I, yeah, and, and um also like I, I'm a pure short seller, you know. I'm I really like I went to Columbia to expose that that bit. And that's not the only short report I did. I did a few of them. I did a, a, a few, I was part of a few. So like I'm not a trader that's like long and short and rules and a stop target this and and uh no matter what or just all size for this i i i see certain plays like everybody has a different personality all these stocks have a different personality some are really shitty some are less shitty you know uh, i'm gonna put more size on some if a pumper's on it if zach morris is on it i'm gonna get it you know it's like i had a mm-hmm. a, a bot on these on these guys last year and i was i was like oh this guy shorted oh, i'm gonna short this guy you know so that you know so That's i have i I have a, a picture in my head. Okay, Zach Morris, he, he's he's pumping this to feed his cocaine habit or whatever, and like he's you're like, well, he's, he's so like, so Zach Morris. So let's go back to let's let's go back to twenty twenty one. Cei that fucker went from yeah, yeah. fifty cents to like five dollars. Like, see, at, those, like some those days are, the, but those, those days, days are over. Done. Those days are over. So see, when, when those days became over. It's like every single one of his is. A, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna, if he get if he yeah. if he goes GCTK on me, then I was like, hey Zach, you take this one. I, I, <laughs> but, it, but it never did, you know. So, but yeah. that's that's the way I approach it. I'm like, but then I size accordingly, so they don't do that. I'm tr- I'm fighting against them, you know. It's it's like a UFC fight. You don't just roll over and die, or you don't just go all out the first round. You you go and and you you pace it out. So like. UFAB, yeah, I wasn't full size each time, but I was hitting it aggressive. That's why I like to recycle the shares. I short it, cover, and then like I'll be flat. And then if it bounces back, I'll reshort it because like I'm I'm able to like regroup, you know. Um I'm not full size and like because if I'm full size, so like that's one thing. So like in Cobra, uh they have me at I, I and I, I don't complain about it. I just have a 10k share max size. So like that forces me to plan accordingly. So I usually am like 9,000 shares, eight, you know, and then maybe I'll, like for a UFAB, if it goes, if it squeezes a little bit, then I'll add full size and I'll, I'll mm-hmm. you know, I'll give it time to play out. But man, you know, so like, I don't know. It's, it's just like you get more confidence as you gain because like you're taught from other mentors and stuff to like have the stop loss, have this and this. So that what, at what level do you decide for yourself what is going to be so you know you let's say for example you keep getting stopped out at the top you know or and and it fades all the way back down then you've got to adjust to that so you just tweak and tweak and tweak and you figure yourself out and you're like oh, okay this one's a zach morris pump this guy's a you know he's he's a sloppy pumper now and the days of cei are done there's no more yeah. people are not with stimulus checks anymore waiting to buy zach morris you know so now yeah. now he's just out of desperation he's just doing these weak pumps trying to make a few bucks to support his bad habit lifestyle. So yeah, I, for me, that helps like this, the whole scenario I gave with like Hernan Cortez and all that, and the whole conquistadors, what was going on in the whole Western hemisphere at the time in the 15th century. Like that's the way I look at it. I look at the whole, the whole thing. Like what's this moon market guy and who's buying this. And like, I look in his chat room, I'm seeing everything. People sending me screenshots of moon market and stuff. So like, it has I think no that's worth uh, joining 
I think it's like a no. small fee to join that one, or you don't. Look at oh, chat oh, that one? No, no, I, I don't pay to join any any chats. But like, uh-huh. someone sent me a screenshot of it, and you know, it it, it helped my. Com- but I already have this tweet, so like, you yeah. know, just you know what I'm saying. So like, I don't know. I I I, I like information, and I like organized information. If you look at like my setup, is you know everybody's set up with trade. Traders are pretty organized for the most part, as far as like setups. Every everybody yeah. has whatever works for them. But like, you know, so like I have a. I try to get as much information because if I see something like GCTK, I had a loss on that. You know, that was that w- that one got me. You know, it's like because I was like, oh, no news. But then it was it was a Nasdaq compliance play from Israel. It's like they took it in- insane. And then when you see the fee rate get jacked up, so it's like okay, at one point through the, you, you know, so you got to know for yourself like the eject button. What 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 is that for you? For me, it was that fee rate. So if the fee rate and, and I'm holding overnight, I'm already getting squeezed. So then now I'm yeah. like, all right, I gotta, I gotta. This is, this is, that's my. That in a lot of cases, that's my stop loss, you know. Yeah. So, so like, what, what is your like? You gotta decide. But like for the longest time, yeah, the first, as you as you get screen time and stuff, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta play it safe. You can't be gunslinger, you know. So you can't, you know, you gotta have these strict rules. Now this could be a setup though. Okay, a moon market pump, subby pump. It's up two hundred percent. You know, uh, maybe you give it a couple days. Maybe you give it a day because if the fee rate is low, twenty percent, you can bro. Like today was like the it went. <laughs> it's it's at twenty cents now. You know, it's like it's back to yeah, where it came it's from. insane. So it's like somebody's fade so hard. I mean, it's just yeah. You know, so, I, I like trading them, but they can they rip really hard too. So I guess that's good information to take yeah. back. Like maybe more of a discretionary approach on these and be willing to. Uh, yeah. So you have to. So maybe like you know separate. So you got to categorize the types of setups and trades and which ones are discretionary, which one's systematic, which one's, uh, if it's a, like, I don't even trade micro floats that much anymore or nano floats. Like if I do, it's very small size and it's in and out like super, I don't want to be with the position in there for a long time, but, um, yeah. So it's like different. You, you treat everything differently, you know? So yeah. Yeah. No, it seems like, it seems like a lot of traders kind of have a love hate relationship with the micro floats, right? I think like my biggest losses come from the ticker Lucy. Uh, that thing has been me um, a few times, and um, so you, you yeah, know, I just got to be a little bit more careful on these things. Uh, is is all, especially would, in a certain set. Like yeah. in the in in my in my Discord, like the little private section, I have no one talking about micro floats or nano float. If it, I, I I and like. I even made a, a separate podcast uh, talking about that, so like they can listen to that. And like, I don't even want to see it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to even be tempted. So like, I know a lot of systematic traders. They like they like they oh float doesn't matter, and then you know they get squeezed and it, it's they, you know, and then they they uh, there's it just happens over and over and over again. It's like if something happens over and over and over again, why you know. It's, Stop doing it, you know. No more micro floats. No, no more nanos. Mm. You need maybe until you're well capitalized in the future after like five years experience or something, you know. So I don't. I I think it's it's a it's a discipline game, you know, because you're gonna see a lot of swings there. Oh, I could have had that. I could have had this. Like, why are there so many traders that are systematic that are struggling and with uh, micro floats and nano floats and they swear by them. For example, I hate to call him out, man, because I, I like the guy, like Maoxian. I, mm. I have his sub stack, and like he's really struggling the past month and a half or so. Like it's pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty gnarly. Him as well, yeah, he's and been it's like, around it's, for like twenty-five years or something. Yeah. So simple though. Don't trade the micro floats. That's it. Boom. <laughs> Problem yeah, solved. Was, I think he got. Boom. I think he was talking about PYXS. He's swinging that thing, and that thing went. The moon um, for days bro, and... the, the only thing, and I, I like, I get pissed when people bring it up, like in the in the in the Discord. No micro floats, man, it, because it, the, especially in the chat room, because like the chat room is all short sellers. So we're you're telling me twenty of us are gonna short this? No, man, short that on your own time. And I, I do short micro floats here and there, but it's a specific strategy. It's a specific mm. halt halt play. Specific things line up. The the stars line up, and then like I'll I'll go small size. And nail it, and nail it, crush mm-hmm. it. But that's my micro float. But why are yeah. everybody? Yesterday I traded like freaking 10, 12 tickers. 
I think one of them yeah. was was a micro float. Um, yesterday was one of my best days. Actually, it was a top mm. top three day. Uh, past yeah, man. yeah awesome. thanks, man. None, but none was a micro float. None. What I did. So it's all about stock selection. Stock selection. Yeah, I've heard that term. Use it. But the the yeah. easy ones. What? So it's like Tim Sykes. I remember used to say, "Okay, let's say you're in the M- like. Do you want to play basketball against midgets, or do you want to play against like?" college players or something like i want to play against midgets i want to dunk on the midget man so i just picked the pick the easy setup why are you picking out this overcrowded setup like like vine today i would have not traded vine but like there was nothing else so i was like you know the thesis is intact i i'm in tune with it you know i'm gonna push the you know i'll trade it a little bit here and there but like i did not want to trade that yet i almost was like oh yeah you know, but well, like, it was only yeah. up twenty five percent at the open, so I mean, yeah, people that exactly. were slamming that were getting and, squeezed right out of the right out of the gate. So and and easy to borrow, and it's a my it's t- almost borderline microflow, and it's like has news is c- kind of good. So and a lot of volume. It was not, a, and it's like nothing else was going on. So I was like, I was like, all right, man, I'll, I'll short this, but uh, I did not want to, <laughs> did not want to short it, but um, but like, you know, it's it's just. I think if, if you're trying to turn a curve, you got to pick it's stock selection is, is like pick the easy ones. Like, you know, it's, you, you, I know people, they back test, they get all the stats and like, oh yeah, I, I only short this. I don't care about float. I don't care about news, but then it's like, I don't know, man, you're, you're opening up. You just pick the easy ones. They, they're super easy. Even if it's like not that liquid, just pick an easy one, man. What you giving, I don't know. Money is money. <laughs> money is money. That's why I would trade the pre market. Um, in the pre market, when I first, oh yeah, when I first, check this out. So when I first arrived to Puerto Rico, there was a couple of whales in there in, in trade space. And, and uh, I'm trading the pre market. I'm there at four in the morning and everyone's wondering, like, who the hell am I? I'm unknown at the time, no podcast, nothing. And uh, I'm just trading pre market and making like, I don't know, 500 to to $1,000 or something like that in the pre market. Off of like borderline illiquid stocks, and um, one of the this big trader comes. He must trade like a hundred million dollars worth of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. He has Bloomberg Terminal and all this crazy, all this stuff. And um, you know Bloomberg Terminal, right? You heard of yeah. it? Yeah, it's like yeah. thirty thousand a year, and it's like you gotta like be a I don't know. Anyway, so he he asked me, "Hey, is David, what's going on?" He's like, "With this coffee, he would show up at nine in the morning." So like, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm here since the pre market." He's like, "Oh, what did you trade today?" And I said, oh, I traded. He's like, it's like, that's illiquid. I can't. And I said, for me, that's good, man. I'm going to take my $1,000. That's pretty good. For, for him, he's not, it's not even yeah, you worth can do it. That. Man. He can't even do that, though. I mean, he, he can't he do it. But move that stock to the, in the pre market, yeah, right? But, uh, but not only years, that, not only yeah. that, but he doesn't even care about $1,000. Right. I care about $1,000. So, like, uh, most people that listen to the podcast, well, yeah, I say most most people, a thousand dollars is good. It's a decent day. It's a good day. So, what's the big deal? It's like, doesn't matter. Why do you need the most volume and the smallest stock to get a thousand dollars? You don't need. Yeah, I, I think that's unnecessary. There's other easier setups out there that are not talked about. That it's almost like take like playing against midgets in listed lens, not OTC. So why are you going after? If you want, you know what I'm saying? Like I. I like I said, like yesterday, I traded so many stocks, and a lot of them are like people. Are, I'm, I know people are wondering. I throw the, the charts on t- Twitter, like, "Oh, well, what the hell is he thinking? I don't even know." <laughs> like, what do they do? like? But like, I'm. I already know from from being around so long and the way I trade and learning from from my own pre market experience and like what other people like. Money is money, man. It's like why why get the hardest one? Like getting all yeah, that. I agree. You know, it's like, like imagine if, okay, let's say Vine today uh, did what it did, but there was like five other easy midday parabolic straight up crash. And like, they only had a volume surge for five minutes and the rest is illiquid the rest of the day. That would have been a good setup. I would rather do that. You know, it's like, why get all this mental capital of like breaking down Vine and like this and this and trade the matrix and all this just to get a minimal gain out of it. When you can just yeah. you know pick a, a nice setup that comes out of nowhere with no news and and uh and it's yeah. you know, I I rather I prefer that you know so but um yeah what yeah, else definitely and, prefer the easy stuff yeah no um yeah that's good information just because 
um, would seeing in some of the traders that have charts like that, where you're like, so you basically you're talking about pain tolerance, talking about stock collection, and then more or less you're like, well, shit, if it goes GCTK, I guess it is got so, it, man. That so the, the, the pain tolerance that comes through experience too, man, you know? So I remember like when I, when the first couple of years I didn't, I couldn't read the stocks like I do now, you know? So I, it's like a lot of it was just like up in the air. I just like uh, hoping, like okay, I know the stock is gonna go down. It is a shit code. That was like, <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> I didn't, I couldn't break down like the whole scenario of what's going on. AC Wainwright, the dilution. We didn't even have dilution tracker back then. Um, I, you know, all time record volume. Looking left, looking at the multi year, the resistance to this, the the wick and the candle. I didn't, I, I couldn't read. I couldn't read it like that. I was just going off a couple things, you know, and, and it's like, it's a different level of confidence, you know? So, but, um, but yeah, you know, it's just, a, and also the, the pain tolerance. So like, you don't, you know, it's like everyone's net worth and, and, and expenses are different. So every, every, every dollar amount affects people differently. You know what I'm saying? Like it affects you differently than it affects me a hundred bucks. Me losing a hundred bucks is different, or a thousand bucks is different than you, than me, than the guy over there. Then, remember in Puerto Rico, I said this guy would trade like my whole family's net worth. Even still, he trades like my whole family's net worth at this level. So, like me losing a thousand dollars, even now affects for him. It's like it's, he he absolutely doesn't even feel it. Like maybe mm -hmm. it feels yeah. like lunch, like lunch to him. Like like you know, yeah, like yesterday. Twitter traders yesterday they said he traded like. Two or three, four million shares or something like that. I mean, these guys are out there for trading against them. And uh Yeah, exactly. So exactly. So uh in fact in Puerto Rico, when that guy told me that, I I and I, I told my I, I my head, I was like, damn, I'm doing the right thing. Cause I don't want to compete against this guy. So if he's sleeping and I'm getting a thousand dollars, the easy like this is the easy way to do it. Yeah. So no, that makes sense for sure. So yeah. But but yeah, what what else? You um because uh, we got. I mean, how much time do you got? I can talk all day long, you know. But like, yeah. I mean, I wish I. I wish I had more. Uh, I do. I do have to go to work soon. But I do have like another, another quick question for you. Like, yeah. As far as like adding adding to winners, like so again, it's kind of adding to winners. I'm guessing it has to do with the same thing: stock selection, overall picture, dilution, all that stuff. Um, and I, you know, I see you. You're you're covering. You're putting it back on. You're slamming it more, covering. So I guess like that, that whole style that you have. So you you were pre-market in Puerto Rico. That was what two years ago? Two thousand three. All, all of two thousand twenty-one. So yeah, damn man. I guess it was. Yeah, I mean, I, no, 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 no. Yeah. I I I left uh, I left Puerto Rico mid last year. So yeah, that's in, actually has been it's been about. 10 months and like what you're doing now like intraday versus that like totally totally different and um you know adding the winners i think is something that everyone wants to learn how to do and because you can really increase your your profit factor with that but um you know when you're letting it go up against you and then you want to kind of start adding on the way down i don't know just maybe if you could okay kind of talk, so, go through your head yeah uh, yeah adding to the winner so adding to a winner, so on the short side, um, I don't like to chase a sock down on weakness. And at the same no. time, if it if it's – so there, there comes a breaking point where it's like if the thesis is intact with with uh, the short sell, like I will I will add my – up to like that – when I'm getting married to 10,000 shares like at the moment is my max size. Um, but for a long time, it was 5,000 shares. And no matter what the stock price is, that's what the Cobra allowed. And um, when I start to approach, like, let's say, I'll keep it, let's say 10,000. That's what I'm doing now. When I start to approach 8,000, 9,000, then I start to be like, okay, is this is this a winner? Like, um, the, is the thesis intact? Like, when it comes close to that threshold of, like, max size, I'm like, are, because short sellers, we got to, we, average into a place so like is the thesis intact it's like if this if this and i'm like oh okay thesis dilution ac wainwright algos vwap algo is on this and this we had the top wick all right thesis is intact i'm talking about vine thesis is intact however easy to borrow the squeeze could could it could squeeze a lot more it could we could see this thing at five i want to be i want to have enough shares 
to average up to five. So maybe seventy five hundred shares is my max size. Let's see, let's see if it can. Let's see if some extra volume comes in and it squeezes. And it doesn't. I'm like, all right, let me add one, a five hundred more, five hundred more. But I'm still leaving some space there because, like, you know, if it does go to five, then it can break out some more. Uh, who knows? Because it was a re reverse split not too long ago. So like you know, it's that's what I'm going by. So like the thesis is is the, if the thesis is intact, then I'm still playing it. I'm still averaging in, and but I'm not. When it breaks down the backside, I usually don't don't chase it down. It's like the thesis has to be intact on the front side. Maybe a little bit on if I enter on the backside. If 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 I didn't even enter at all on the front side, then yeah, I'll enter on the backside. You know, but like on the top of the backside, like a big nasty red candle or something. When it's ex super extended, like UFAB, for example, or or that one you mentioned, um, the BLCK or something like that. Uh, but but um, but yeah. So yeah. But then it, it, that, it's a fine line of uh, when like early on, my first couple of years, um, when I had IB as a broker, I didn't have that limit of shares. And sometimes you break your rules, you break, be undisciplined, especially the, the first few years, right? You know, we're starting out um, and fighting that urge to add because a lot of times you get away with it. So um, I had to, when I was journaling back then, this is like 2020, 2021, even 2022, it's like, all right, when the stock goes uh, red against me, I'm not adding. If it goes red against me, let's, let's say 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, I'm not adding. I'm actually looking to get out. Now, I, at that time, I would consider my thesis wrong because I, I, that wasn't my intent for that to happen. Now, these days, I'm going by so much more information from experience that, like, I have – I, 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 I it's, it's a different way of trading. Like, I, I, I average in for that certain amount of shares. But back then, I would be like, oh, the stock's going red against me. I don't add to it, you know? So, Interesting, yeah. You know? Okay, or, that makes or, sense. Or if you take starter size, like back then I'll be like, oh, let's say a thousand shares starter, and then I'll do a hundred shares, a hundred shares, a hundred shares, and then two thousand shares max size, and then I would not, I would stop it. But like the bad trades would come from me adding to it, so then I stopped doing that. So like you got, you know, through journaling, you 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 uh you figure out okay. Also, it depends how you're trading. Are you doing one block? size are you doing four splitting it in four are you doing um 100 lots hitting it like a machine gun are you doing 1000 shares and then 500 shares and then like 100 100 or so like there's just so many ways to do it uh you know it's you gotta whatever yeah. way you decide it's got to be well thought out beforehand like outside of the trading hours and you got to figure it out but like there is a fine line with short selling. Averaging in is, you know, just add, add, add. It's, that's not a plan. You know, it's like I, 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 I hear. I, I remember. Uh, what do you call it? I think it was chat with traders. SMB. No, SMB Capital did a video a long time ago of a guy that made a hundred thousand dollars in, in shorting. Then he lost a hundred thousand. So for six months, he made a hundred thousand by add, 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 and then he lost it all on one trade. I mean, so like yeah. eventually it comes to get you. If you don't have a, 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 a thinking about it, you're just adding, adding, adding because it's a it's a shit co and this is small caps. Yeah. You know, it's gonna it's gonna get you. So oh, totally, yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. So I mean, if I'm if I'm on the outside and I didn't have this conversation with you today, I'm looking at your chart. I'm like, well, he's just add, add, add it. And you know, same. I'm saying the same thing. It's like where where are you wrong? But so if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like. You have a set size that you're willing to use. You have your bigger picture. And more or less, you're never going to go above the size and you're kind of willing to get squeezed once you reach this, your max size. A little you bit. know, there's no right way to do it. In fact, honestly, putting those charts uh, and, the, and the executions on Twitter, that's a recent thing. And I I, I did it because like I have a, a like a, for ten dollars a month, people can watch, uh, listen to my audio. I don't know if you know, of like my trade journal uh, every 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 almost every day or like a few yeah. times a week. And uh, people ask me to to share it, and I was like, All right, I'll share it. But like for a long time, I I don't I don't like sharing this because I, it's 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 not sh sharing like a what's going on. Like I'm looking at resistance levels, I'm looking at news, 
like PHIO yesterday was was a micro float popped up midday mm-hmm. halt. I don't short micro floats, but this one had mouse testing news. I like shorting mouse testing news. I always I yeah. always have, and I've done well on them his, historically. Michael Good yeah. taught me that, yeah. and. Uh, it's a midday halt, certain amount of volume. I'm playing discretionally with with a small amount of shares, and it halted up so much. Um, but you know, when I throw the chart and the execution there, it looks like what the hell did this guy do? So then you your imagination can take over and start having conspiracy theories of what I'm doing. Like you don't understand like uh, what yeah. what I'm looking at and like how I'm interpreting it. For sure. So that's why it's good to ask. So yeah, I'm glad I'm but but to chat but. About it. But I'm looking at like resistance levels. I'm looking at you know the news, historical flow, all this stuff, and I'm deciding ahead of time like how I'm gonna play this, you know. So, um, I appreciate you know, that. Dude, am, I, am I getting I'm... aggressive? Am I am I gonna get super aggressive with this? Am I not gonna get super aggressive with this? Can this mic? If if this is a micro flow, if this is a one million point five million flow. I'm not going to go 10,000 share size. I'm going to go 1,000 shares. Then if it yeah. halts up on me, maybe I'll add a sprinkle a tiny bit in there. I'm talking about one or 200 shares. And then if it gives me, if it flushes back, I get out. And then it, they usually pop right back up. So I'm reading this like a sport. So like, um, yeah, it's just, there's no real answer, man. It's just like, there's no, like, I'm not doing like exact rules for, for everything. You know what I mean? So, yeah. No, man, I appreciate it. I'm really, um, that makes a lot of sense because honestly, and I do like seeing your charts, but I hope you keep posting them up there. I, yeah. I like seeing yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I will. I will. I'll, I'll keep posting them, you know? So, yeah, because um, I mean, you can't tell a story from a chart. I mean, uh, that's on post, but it's it's fun to uh, kind of look and try and see what they're looking at. I know I did that with like some of like, I went through ADS speed, right? Like for years, I used to post stuff like that and I would dissect everything that you posted on Twitter, all day faders, great, you know, great. Account. Yeah. I uh, think, I think it, it is, it is, it is good to see. I mean, it's like, but you gotta, but you have to understand, okay, every execution arrow, you don't know the size. You don't right. know, you can't see the full picture of, see the people, they get stuck on looking at what the chart is. What about like the resistance area from the past looking left? What was going on in the market that day? What's going you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So like Yeah. You know? I hear you. So that's per- that's perfect. Um all right. Well my daughter wants to be done. Yeah, hey, yeah, how so you doing? I will uh Hey, a right, future, future trader right there, future short seller. Yeah, well, we'll see. But hopefully, <laughs> doctor engineer. Yeah, <laughs> a doctor engineer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, All right, Buffy. For I sure. Appreciate um, it, man. Um, yeah, it was no great problem. talking to you. Yeah, for sure. Man. We'll we'll catch up soon. Yeah. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.